Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Powerful Nothing, a Magic the Gathering podcast. I'm your host, Dan, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, James. How's it going, dude? Pretty good, pretty good. We have many, many magic cards to talk about today. Yes, today is our set review for Cube for the Murders at Karlov Manor set. Lovingly on top of the set itself, on top of the commander product that comes out with the set, there's also a board game, and we have some cool cards from that as well to talk about. So this week we're going to be looking at white, blue, black, and red, and then next week we'll be looking at everything else. Just make sure you follow the podcast so you get notified when that episode comes out. Yeah, so for context, we're going to be reviewing the cards in the new set for Cube specifically, so... Not going to be mentioning constructed formats here. We're not going to be talking about booster draft. And we're certainly not going to be talking about every card in the set, only the cards we think either will be good in cube or that have a lot of hype in cube, even if we're not actually that hyped about them ourselves. No, exactly. Yeah. 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 Every card we're talking about today has to compete against every other card ever printed in the history of Magic. So, so that is the lens that we are looking at these cards through. Yeah, so let's jump in with our first card. First up, we have Assemble the Players. It is one white for enchantment. You may look at the top card of your library any time. Once each turn, you may cast a creature spell with power two or less from the top of your library. So I think kind of the obvious place to just start with this is obviously something like White Weenie. In that, that, this effect will be quite good. Um, It depends on how consistent you are going to be casting spells off the top. That's the thing, like, like, like... in in that deck, like you don't really want to be playing this on turn two. Like like effectively on turn two, this is a do nothing enchantment that does not really help the white aggressive decks on turn two, which kind of means that in re- in reality it's more of like a, a spell you're playing on turn like four or five, and there are just a lot more impactful spells at that point in the curve for those kind of decks. Um, it does feel to get this to work, you kind of have to warp your deck around building this, and also your draft and therefore probably the cube. It kind of, I'm not going to say it's it's like the white collected company, but in terms of how you think about the deck construction, that might be how you think about this. This does also stop you playing some very good three drops in your white aggressive deck, things like the bigger Thalia, things like uh, Donto Vanguard, that kind of stuff. Actually, how big is Donto Vanguard to begin with? It's a free one. It is a 3-1, yes, exactly. Oh, no, sorry. Vanguard actually is a 1-1 one, one that gets plus 2 plus 0 and it is attacking. So Vanguard... Vanguard's actually perfect. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Um, I think this card is fine, but I just don't think the decks that will want this will be super high on it. Is that fair, James, or, or is there more play to this than I'm thinking of? Oh, I think there's, if anything, less play to it than <laughs> you were suggesting. Um, no, I think there's... Um, the issue is that the decks that meet this criteria of having a lot of low power creatures want to be aggressive. They're therefore not going to want to play this on turn two. You're basically just going to play this when you've run out of other stuff to do. And at that point, you know, maybe a third of your deck is hits. Like, it's hard to get much higher than that. You know, in your white aggressive deck, you're going to have equipment, you're going to have planeswalkers, you're going to have removal spells, and not even all of your creatures are hits off of this. Um, And then even when you do hit, the fact that it's limited to once per turn means you don't get to have those really, really great hit turns where you hit like multiple creatures in the row off this. Um, Yeah, I I don't really see a spot for this card. No, that's fair. But but, um, what about our next card, James? Our next card is Aurelia's Vindicator. This is two white white for a 4-2 creature angel with flying lifelink and ward two it also has disguise so this is the first time we've we've hit a disguise card disguise is basically the updated version of morph i am hyped for that yes morph (laughs) Morph is a great mechanic and i think disguise is uh disguise is a nice nice iteration on it so with disguise you can play the card face down as a 2-2 2-2 for free colorless mana, as with Morph, but with Disguise, it also has Ward 2 when face down. Um, I think this is a reasonable thing to upgrade just because Power Creep is real, right? Um, mm-hmm. Free mana 2-2s two ain't what they used to be. Um, I think Ward 2 is a nice way to just put a bit more a bit more juice on the uh, face down creature. Um and then, obviously, all the disguise cards will have a disguise cost, which lets you turn it the creature face up. So, in this case, the disguise cost is X 
three and a white, so four mana plus X. And when Aurelia's Vindicator is turned face up, you exile up to X other target creatures from the battlefield and or creature cards from graveyards. And when Aurelia's Vindicator leaves the battlefield, returned the exiled cards to their owner's hand. Um, this is pretty interesting, actually. Um, obviously, it's a lot of mana, right? Um, by the time you have turned it, played it face down, turned it face up for even x equals one, say you're um, you're now nine mana deep, uh, eight mana deep into this card total, um, which is kind of rough. But you do get a lot for that, and it scales really well, right? So your sort of baseline is you can just turn it face up, remove two of their creatures. Um, or you can save your own creatures from a removal spell, say, like if you then have the creatures under this and it's um, and you get them back to your hand when it dies. I, I think this is just like quite a lot of impact when you do have the mana to pay it face down. Having said that, I suspect if this is in your opening hand, most of the time you'll probably end up just running this out face up. Um, four power flying and lifelink for four mana is is just a good deal. Um, normally the issue would be well, this it, it's like ridiculously vulnerable at two toughness, but ward two really helps there. Um, doesn't solve the problem like yeah, they can still lightning bolt this for three mana, right? And that doesn't feel great. But um, I th- I think the card is I think the card is pretty solid actually. Um, it's also like emergency graveyard hate. And just a note on Disguise, turning a Disguise creature face up does not use the stack. You cannot go... Yeah, is, it, is it a special action? It's a special yes. action. <laughs> Love a good special action. Yeah, um, so they, they can't go... You don't go, I'll pay the mana, turn it face up, and they kill it in response. Uh, but this trigger they obviously can respond to, which which is also not ideal for you. No, that makes sense. I... We generally see these type of like cards, like actually, well, spoilers. There's two of this effect kind of thing in this set. We normally see one in each set, kind of like the creature that comes in, takes something with it until it is removed itself, and and then your opponent gets the creature back. This is probably the best, just like raw body of this type of effect that we've seen. Like the four mana four two flying life link ward two. That is better than most bodies that we have that do a similar type job. So yeah, it's. Oddly, more for it's kind of aimed more at the decks that want to be beating down, I think, than the ones that kind of necessarily want it as an answer. The kind of the answer, like it, it is very expensive, but but it can do multiple things as well. So it's I, I don't say it's like a board wipe, but it almost is kind of like a one sided like remove their blockers, push damage through type jobby. But yeah, like when you're up to eight nine mana, that is not normally where like mono white. Or like any kind of like aggressive decks isn't they're going to struggle to get their kind of curve up to the up to that point because like yes you can split it over two turns but that's still like six seven mana to remove someone's board and get your thing through so I don't know cool card but it might just be a, a little bit expensive kind of one last thing I did want to mention on disguise and uh, and face down cards is, is that they do get better in multiples if if your opponent doesn't know like like if, if you're running just this in your cube. It's going to be very obvious what it is. If you're running multiples, then there's it is the kind of guessing game or kind of like, is it is it this? Is it that? That kind of thing. Is it Willbender? This kind of thing. Like, um, they do get better in, in multiples. So, so if you're thinking of running this one, maybe consider running a couple of other of others in some other slots to do that kind of what is it type thing. Yeah, I I think that's a great point. I would actively try quite hard to have not just one disguised creature in your cube because um, it really detracts from the. The point of the mechanic, right, is for hidden information in a lot of ways. Um, it is a similar thing in the last iteration of Modo Cube with a delayed blast fireball, is it, for like deal two to their creatures or you foretell it? But it's the right. only foretell card in the cube. And that is like very much a card that you can play around, right? So <laughs> yeah, it, was, okay. it was a bit disappointing, really. Yeah, I think try and get multiple disguise cards in if you're going to have any. Ideally, like some in the same color because that, you know, so otherwise it's like, Oh, my blue white opponent disguised the card, and the only other disguised card is in green, so I know what it is. No, cool. Makes a lot of sense. All right, let's move on to our next white card, and it's another new type of card. We have our first case, James, of the day. 
Uh, this is Case of the Uneaten Feast. It is a single white free, free enchantment case. It has, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. That is the static ability of this enchantment of this case. So to solve the case, at the beginning of your end step, if you've gained five or more life this turn, the case is solved. You've worked out who, who done it. When that happens, the case is solved, which means that you sacrifice this case, and creature cards in your graveyard gain, you may cast this card from your graveyard until end of turn. So there are decks, so the base level of this card, it is, it is a single white for enchantment that does the soul sister style of effect of when a creature comes into play under your control, you gain a life. There are decks that want that, like, 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 like generally in higher power level cubes, you don't really see just like life gain as a, as a archetype. But in lower power level cubes, you will see that. In higher power level cubes, there are decks that want life gain effects. I'm specifically meaning ways of starting off combos, like, like involving things like Scurry Oak or Herd Bailoth, um, Squirrel Twin for anyone who's been playing Arena. Um, they need ways of either putting the first counter onto them or gaining life because they normally combine with things like uh, Heliod, um, which puts counters on things when you gain life. Or um, I think there's combos with. Scurry Oak or Herd Bailoth, they make a token whenever you put a counter on something. But um, if you're gaining life, they combo with Yorgmoth Transition as well. So, so that nice little like three card combo thing, I think, could be a a excuse to put this in your deck, or, or just put it in your cube as a thing for people to do with it. In terms of solving it, I don't think it's actually too hard. Like five five life is not super hard when you're gaining life whenever a, a creature comes into play. All you really need, I think, is like a creature with like two or three power with lifelink and then you're most of the way there to triggering this and then every creature you had in your graveyard just being able to be recast does seem very strong like like if you can actively get to the soul part of this i think it is very very strong like it seems really good in like a deck with like lurus for example like lurus has lifelink that seems really good with this um yeah I, I don't think it's for every cube but if you're doing life gain or combos that need life gain to kick them off then i could be tempted by this yeah, I think I would basically just go with if, if your cube is playing the Soul Sister effects for one mana one ones that gain life when a creature ETBs, this is probably this is I think a better version of that. Um, those cards aren't there to be creatures and beat down anyway. They this is harder for them to interact with, and if you have a good turn, gain five life, which is very much within within range on, on a dedicated life gain deck, then you get to yark will your creatures later, and that's great. Um, outside of that, it's, I, I don't think I'm interested in this as like a value card specifically, just because it's... Um, like, yeah, it's doable to get to the... to solve it, but it's... Um, if you're not using the ability before then, I think it's, it's just a little bit too much setup, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not a card that, uh, uh, that, that in a vacuum you want. It needs some help with it. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Doorkeeper Thrill. This is one no white for a one two creature Thrill with Flash and Flying. And it has artifacts and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. This is a nice, hateful little card, I think. Um, <laughs> the flash is really good here, right? Um, you're just going get to uh, get to completely blank some, some good artifact ETBs, right? Even, um, I might say, like, Tinker for Portal, for Portal to Phyrexia, for example, and you just flash this guy, and it's such a huge game. Um, and you get creatures well saved. Like, there's so many creature ETBs in most cubes. Um, I think this is a nice, a nice option to have. Um, I think anyone who's played against like five mana relish on knows knows how powerful that ability is. Um, obviously this doesn't double your ETBs, but it's two mana and it has flash. Um, also like the flying it wears equipment nicely. Um, I sort of suspect that it will end up being a card you board in more than it will be a card that you main deck, but I think you will board it in quite a lot. No, that's fair. No, I, I, I'm actually quite high on this, but I think it's more kind of from a design point of view for Cube because like, like it's it, it, it kind of fits into the white decks I want to try and push a bit more in like my own Cube, where it's kind of like annoying hate bear death and taxes style of style of creatures kind of deck rather than just like super efficient 
white aggro creatures. This does a little bit more than just kind of like it, it, it than like it's a lot of power and toughness with first strike, something like that. Like 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 this is way more more interesting to me to me than like a porcelain legionnaire that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, and yeah, like like you've nailed it completely with the flash. Like like the fact that the this can turn off like a Thassa's Oracle or like a Evoke Elemental, I think is really big game. Like I do quite like that. It it, it gives the white deck some kind of answer to those kind of big combos. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it has a lot of upside. It is just worth noting, though, that the ability is two-sided. Um, oh, it's, it is. will yeah, also okay. turn off your Solitude or your Blade Splicer or, or whatever you're running. So um, that kind of limits... Um, you know, you might be fine with taking that as a risk if you're boarding it in because you know mm-hmm. it's great against your opponent. But if you have, like, a couple of cards in your deck that it's turning off, that might make you reluctant to main deck it, I think. Ah, uh, yes, symmetrical. Damn. <laughs> have one. Right, talking of an ETB, uh, next up we have a card that I, I think we've seen before, James. Uh, next up we have Novice Inspector. This is a single white free one 2 creature human detective. When it enters the battlefield, investigate. So for those who don't know, that means you create a clue token, which is an artifact with pay to generic, sacrifices artifact, draw a card. So this is... In every way, just a second copy of Thraben Inspector. I, the added detective line, I, I don't think really matter in a lot of cubes. But Thraben Inspector has just been such an unassumingly good card. Like it kind of goes in any deck, really. Like like a white aggressive deck is it's a fine body that buffs up your creature count while giving you some card draw later on if you've run out of gas. In a control deck, it blocks a Ragavan or whatever the aggro threat is, nice and early. That's all good, and the fact that the clue is an artifact means it can even go in like white X artifact decks. Um, it's just so versatile for just a single white mana. I think realistically, that any cube that's above 540 will probably consider running both of them, running both Thraven Inspector and Novice Inspector. Whether you want them both at like 360s, I'm not 100% sure just because of the variety in your effects being cool. Um, but yeah, this is. It's also a common, this will probably just be one of the most played cards in this set, I would assume. Like, we love Thraven Inspector, Novice Inspector's going to see a, a fair bit of play. Yeah, I mean, Thraven Inspector's a phenomenal card. It's, like, it looks solid, but it plays so much better than it looks. Like, it's it just kind of low-key does everything you want to do in most of your white decks. Um, it's a creature, it, like, you just get something on the board that holds your equipment. It doesn't cost you a card. The clue enables your artifact synergies later if you're doing that. But it also just give, gives you value when the game goes long. It's um, And because you're in white, you can flicker it as well, right? This is what makes it a lot better than... You no know, stuff like card evidence in blue is like kind of a comparable card on the face of it. But then... but. This, you get the flicker synergies, you get a point of power, and just white wants a one-mana creature in as many games as it possibly can. And this just lets you get one into your deck kind of for free, right? Because it's not costing you a card. Will you at least concede that the, the O3 crab on hard evidence is very good vibes, though? An impeccable vibes. <laughs> I will, good, not, good. will not dispute that. <laughs> but yeah, you, you, you know, yeah, I agree. Yeah, a great card. I'm, I'm not going to use the word staple because we already have one of these, but the effect is phenomenal, yeah. For sure. So next up, we have 10th District Hero. This is one white for a 2-3 creature human. It has one white activated ability. Collect Evidence 2. So this is the first time we've seen Collect Evidence, so I'll read this. Um, to Collect Evidence, you exile cards with total CMC N, whatever the uh, collect evidence number is, from your graveyard as part of the cost of either activating an ability or casting a spell. Um, or it's going to be N or more. So if you have a 5-drop in your graveyard, you can pay 2 mana and exile the 5-drop and activate this ability. Um, yeah, so you collect evidence too. 10th District Hero becomes a human detective with base power and toughness 4-4 four, four, and gains vigilance. And then for two and a white, and collect evidence four, so you need to exile a four drop or greater, or multiple cards with total CMC four. 
If Tenth District Hero is a detective, it becomes a legendary creature named Mileva the Stalwart. It has base power and toughness 5-5, five, five, and it gains other creatures you control have indestructible. I think this is a really solid little two drop, actually. Um, listen, just you've got to be aware that this isn't, you're not going to be able to activate the ability on turn three that much for collect evidence to, right? Just because in most games, even in the best scenario, right, you pay the one drop and then you cast this on turn two. Even if they killed the one drop, you don't have two CMC worth of stuff in your graveyard to exile. But I think that's kind of fine because it's already a two three. So it's like decent stats on the face of it. And then later into the game, this becomes a real threat and it's not that much mana to activate. Um, like I can really see, you know, the turn four, you activate this and play another two drop and you get like this pretty good four four. And then the last mode is just a really big threat going long. Um, I mean, listen, white two drops is a pretty competitive slot. There's some really good ones. Um, but I think this is definitely in the mix for sure. No, I, if I'm honest, I, I think I'm a little lower on this. I think just purely from a from a curve point of view, I'm just not a big fan of this. Like, 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 okay, two mana for a two three in white, I don't think is good enough anymore. Just like vanilla by itself. When I first read this card, I did not realize like, like if this was just pay the mana without the collect evidence, then this card would be like f- fantastic. I would super love it. The issue I, I kind of have with it is it, it kind of feels like this is a card you want to play like after a board wipe or something like that help rebuild you but then the ultimate of this card as it were is protection from a board wipe because it gives you other creatures indestructible this doesn't feel like a white aggressive card to me like like this feels more like 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 say you're doing something really grindy in like your abzan section or something like that if like mid-range is good in your cube or in your cube environment then i think this card will be good in like more efficient style of cubes i don't think this will see much play if like creatures getting into combat and like that kind of stuff matters more in your cube and it's, and it's about kind of like longer slightly more drawn out interesting games and magic then that i think is where this card will shine more than like just white aggro turning sideways or like or or that kind of thing yeah no i do get that i've i think i would just say that the white aggro decks aren't like the red aggro decks right they can play really long games quite well um oh that's fair and i think you can build them to do that um and yeah sure you're not playing like a two mana two three on its own but it's like it does impact the board reasonably on turn two, and then I just think it's like such a big threat when you go longer. Um, it's not like they have to kill your stuff, right? You just like cast your removal spell and this is live. Um, like I'm not saying it's like a premium, premium two drop, but if you compare this to something like I don't know Tive Taker, say, which is, is right, often yeah. big for cut, right? Um, I don't know. I think I think they're like comparable power level at least. No, no, I could see that, I, I, and I guess this is a fairly decent like late game draw like mm. if you're if you're top decking on turn like six or seven and nothing any kind of the board's either at parity or there is no board like this can come down and you can up it to being a four four with vigilance straight away like that's not nothing that's quite good yeah for sure and it's kind of nice as well that like white generally just doesn't really use its graveyard very much no that's fair yeah so, like yeah. sure you might not be feeling it that quickly but it's also not costing you much to exile cards from your graveyard no, I can see that. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I should be uh, a little higher on this one. Cool. Right. Next up, we have Unyielding Gatekeeper. It is one white for a 3 2 creature elephant cleric. It has disguise for one and a white. That's the flippy turn face up uh, cost of the card. And when Unyielding Gatekeeper is turned face up, exile another target non land permanent. If you control it, return it to the battlefield tapped. Otherwise, its controller creates a 2 2 white and blue detected creature token. So yeah, this is what I was saying. This set kind of actually has two of these effects. Um, and yes, this one is a little expensive because again, you have to pay it for three generic uh, up front and then pay one and a white to flip it over. The the utility of the card is actually quite nice. If you're doing it to your creature, you're effectively either protecting it, like it can dodge removal this way, or you can rebuy an an ETB effect with it. Like that could be like worth the, the, the mana you're putting into this card. And if it's your opponent's creature, they don't get it back which is also something you don't normally see with these kind of effects. Normally when the gatekeeper goes, they would get it back. But like, no, like, like, like they are getting a 2-2 straight away. But like, I, it's not hard to see a world where you are answering something that's bigger than a 2-2 with this card. Like, that's quite nice. Like, like I, I think generally, like, like, the reason to run this 
I think is if kind of the flavor of your cube is you're supporting Blink in it. Like kind of how like I I was running like Brutal Cathar, which is a similar effect of this when I was supporting humans in my cube. Kind of like there's enough of these options at like two to four mana that you can kind of tailor what you want to suit the effect, basically. So yeah, if you're doing Blink, I think this one is a very solid option for you. Yeah, for sure. I think this does some pretty interesting stuff. Um, cause it's it's a two mana free two, right? Like you wouldn't play it by itself, but if you don't have another free drop, two drop to play on turn two, you just cast this. It's fine. It does the two drop thing. And then, um, yeah, when you have ma- the mana available to have, ideally you cast this and keep two mana up, you just, it's really hard for that not to be good, right? They play a threat. It's like a decent threat. It's good. You kill the threat. You pl- they try and kill one of your creatures. Great. You flicker your creature. You just got like a awesome two for one. Um, and maybe even got some value, right? Like flicker your palace trailer or your, um, or whatever can be can be really insane. Um, having said that, I think this is actually a really big casualty of the um, not having enough disguise creatures thing. That um, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, like this card gets a lot worse when if when you disguise it, they just know exactly what it is. Then they're not going to play their removal spell on their turn into your open mana, right? Um, and I think that that does take a bit away from a card, or they're not going to like run out their best threat and just get it blown up. Um, yeah, but I, I do, I do think it's a solid card, though. Yeah, I, I, I was just having a quick look through. I think we only have one more disguise card that we're talking about, and the so one of the I get why they did it from a play like from a power level point of view, but these don't play nicely with morphs because they're different like backs. They they they're, they're they are different. Like one has an ability, so you represent them with different tokens. So it's not like you can have like morphs in a cube and these creatures in a cube and exp- and them do the what is it thing, basically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. I think it's going to be be hard to have like enough disguise cards where there's meaningful hidden information. Right? No, definitely makes sense. But let's the, the, uh, think similarly to uh, like foretell. It is a mechanic they could go back to in the future. Like, like this it could be a thing we see again, and then and the, these are cards to think about when that happens. Basically, once there's a, a better density of these cards, they'll kind of we'll think about them again. We'll scry all these 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 cards in a few years' time and remember them basically, and then and then they can be cubed again. Yeah, for sure. All right, don't take it, take it away with our last white card of the day. Yeah. So next up, we have Wojek Investigator. This is two and a white. For a 2-4 creature angel detective it has flying, vigilance, and at the beginning of your upkeep, investigate once for each opponent who has more cards in hand than you. Um, so obviously Q being a 2-player format just means and your upkeep, if your opponent has more cards in hand than you, you investigate. Um this is like a fine little source of value. The the thing, the issue I have with it, right, is that the body is just not that aggressive. Two four flying vigilance, great blocker. Like actually, a lot better in a slower deck in lots of ways. Um, but two power to for three mana is just like a little bit disappointing in an aggressive deck. But then the ability is actually better in an aggressive deck, right? Because you're emptying your hand. Yeah, right? they're kind of opposite of each other, aren't they? Yeah. Um, listen, I don't think it's a bad card. Um, it'll definitely do some work if you put it in your cube. But I think that white freeze is just so competitive, you know? Um, and I, I'd be surprised if this one ends up sort of making the cut long term. No, I think that's fair. Like, like it is. It is slightly like it is kind of like a more interesting like wall of omens that kind of thing. But that is, I guess, the point of that card is that it's two mana, not not three. Um, yeah, but like, like I think I could see an aggressive deck playing this and a control deck playing this, which is normally a good thing. But I don't think each either is going to be excited about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 like is, is is this like the twenty second, twenty third card in both of those? Like, 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 like it it does carry equipment very well. Like that could be something for the aggro decks, I guess. Like, yeah, it does. Like, 
and it will it will have matchups where it's great, right? If you're like white and you're playing against mono red, it seems it seems like oh, a great true, yeah, card. Yeah. But like two four flying vigilance, yeah, sign me up. But um, I think just like in the dark against the field, I think it's going to be a bit medium. No, that's fair. Makes sense. All right, let's move on to our first blue card of the day, and mana wise, it's a big one. We have Conspiracy Unraveler. It is five blue blue for a six six creature Sphinx Detective with flying, and you may collect evidence 10 rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. So, this is a very cool card. Um, it's just quite, it's just so much to cast is the downside, but like, um, the main place I'm thinking about this, James, and let me know if you, think, if you think I'm on the right track with this. Like, is this a card that actually goes into like a Dream Halls deck? So in that deck, you're trying to cheat big spells. The backup to their strategies is to normally put the big spells into the bin and then recast them with a card like Mizzix Mastery. So, so, so getting to that Evidence 10 thing where you have to exile total mana value 10 or greater is kind of doable. Um, so if you're putting the big things into the bin, you'll have the ability to do that. The issue with all that being said, though, is getting this creature into play into the first place. There's also be the issue with it in like other decks that could potentially run it, like like Reanimator. Are you going to reanimate this to then play a bunch of big spells for free, or are you just going to reanimate the big thing to win you the game? I think this is a very cool card. I think this is like such a commander card, and I kind of hope I get one uh, at, because I think it looks really, really dumb and really, really fun. But I don't think this is probably one for cube. I, I think it's just too expensive. Yeah, I completely agree. This card's really, really cool. I'm really stoked <laughs> to play with it, but I, I think it is quite bad, unfortunately. Um, the and the issue of dream halls, right? Like, sure, you could dream halls this out and then collect evidence something that out else out, but you could just have collect of dream halls the other big thing out, right? And um, not had this like random seven drop in your deck. Um, well, well, sorry, I guess my thinking was more because like because like with um with Mizzix's mastery, that is eight mana I had to do the overload thing to cast all the spells from your graveyard. So like 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 if you are in theory in a deck that that. Is planning on getting up to like that kind of manner, then in theory you could get to the point where you're casting this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I could see it. It kind of feels like more hoops than you need to jump through, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> if you've already got your dream holes into play, like you could just be doing your thing, right? I don't know that you need this like extra extra step necessarily. Um the only place I thought of why kind of I mean, I think it's probably still bad, but I thought it was like a cool way to use it. <laughs> was if you Oath of Druids into this, then your graveyard's like really, really stocked. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, and then you like kind of just Oathed into an Omniscience, and if you have enough good stuff and like have a 6-6 six, six flyer, then like well, that's maybe that's fun. good. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be so annoying when it's like you Oath into it, but it was like your third card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... D- Generally, it's a cool one, but probably not for most cubes. No, cool. Makes sense. All right. Uh, next up, we have Cryptic Coat. This is two and a blue for a artifact equipment. When Cryptic Coat enters the battlefield, cloak the top card of your library, then attach Cryptic Coat to it. I think this is the first time we've seen coat, uh, cloak, sorry. So to cloak a card, you put it onto a battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature with Ward 2. So basically, as morph as manifest was to morph, cloak is to... What's the name of the mechanic we just read? God knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> disguise, James. Disguise, thank you. Yeah, disguise. <laughs> <laughs> basically, it's manifest with Ward 2. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the equipment, so you manifest the top card of your library, you attach Cryptic Coat to it, as equipped creature has plus one, plus zero, oh, and can't be blocked, and you can pay one or blue to return Cryptic Coat to its owner's hand. I think this is actually decent. Yeah, I like this card. Like, like it's a little slow, but I do really like it. Yeah, like, free to unblockables, like, kind of real, you know? And, um... And just having like that value engine later, like you, you know, you have um, you have five mana, make a two two for as long as you want. You have a three two unblockable. You can just move around the unblockable if you want. Actually, that's not even true. You can't. It doesn't have an equip cost, which is interesting. Um, oh, it doesn't it? Oh, doesn't yeah. have an okay. equip cost. Yeah. So the only way you can get it onto a yes, creature is to okay. cloak onto it. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can. 
if they kill the guy, which they probably will have, they might well have to at some point, right? Free to unblockable is a real threat. It's going to be like phenomenal at killing planeswalkers. It's kind of hard to kill the guy because it has ward two. Um, and just occasionally you're going to cloak into an actual big creature and then you flip it over and your big, big creature has unblockable. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think this, this card has, has some outs to be pretty good. Um, just, just seems like it has a lot of upside, you know. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I quite like it. Like, like I think it's also also worth mentioning is that it's effectively an equipment creature, and like the, one of the issues you often get, and that the we, that we've spoken about before on this podcast is like one of the issues with equipment matters decks is that you need to run a bunch of equipment, which doesn't leave much room for creatures, and that's got a lot better recently with things like living weapon, like getting more cards, reconfigure, and like the Fermiridon mechanic. Like these are all equipments that come with creatures. Like that's effectively what this is. Like 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 it manifests the creature. It, it it makes the creature for you from your deck. So effectively, this is a equipment creature. So you can run this and effects that care about creatures being equipped, and you don't really need to run as many creatures because this will fill that part of your deck. So that part I do quite like as well. Yeah, 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 for sure. I think it's got a lot going on, and it's just you. You know, it's another artifact in your in your artifact deck, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. He's good. I could also maybe see it in something like like Demir Ninjas, something like that. That tends to like unblockable creatures, kind of things going back to your hand, getting value, that kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, it's a great thing to ninja to off of. Because also, right, if you um, if you manifest like a really good non-creature spell, and you can ninja to it back to your hand to get your spell. Oh, you can. Ooh, you can, yeah, that's sweet. Actually, does that work? I'm assuming that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the card goes to your hand. Oh, nice. Okay, sweet. Love that. All right, let's move on. To I think this is the like the key story card of the set. This is like the reveal, as it were. It is dramatic accusation. It is two in a blue for enchantment aura, enchant creature. When it enters the battlefield, tap enchanted creature. Enchanted creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step, and you can pay blue and a blue and shuffle enchanted creature into its owner's library. Also, the art of this is spoiling the who done it from the set. Spoilers for something that's been out for a couple of weeks. It's the middle Tristani, everyone. Right, so this one is a common, and it's mainly here for Pauper Cube. This is definitely more expensive than some of the other options that you have in Pauper Cube. Things like Bind the Monster and Witness Protection. That's the way that you generally get to answer things semi-permanently in those cubes, is to tap them down like forever. And this is one of the few ways where you can actually permanently get rid of it, or semi-permanently get rid of it, because you can shuffle it back into your opponent's deck, basically removing it for the game. It is quite slow. And it is a little expensive, but there must be some good creatures in Pauper Cube that have like really annoying static effects that Blue can't get rid of once they're on the board. So for that reason, maybe this sees play because it has the ability to actually get rid of the on-board effect. But that's kind of the only really place I could see this possibly being run. I don't like it. Um, <laughs> it's so expensive. You've paid five mana once you've... Um... It is. Once I am, you've I am got talking, rid of it permanently. I am talking poor like, 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 I'm aware that like, like, bind the monster and witness protection are both like. I think that they're a single blue. There is also like, there is the three mana one that introduces the monarchy to the game. But I think that card was banned in pauper because it was a bit obscenely good. Yeah, I've not played a ton of pauper cube, but I imagine that card is busted in half if you put it in your pauper cube. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't know. Like, I get blue is like struggling for removal, but. What I've seen of pauper cubes, they tend to be like, like the threats aren't great, but they are like kind of efficient, you know? Like, it's not like you just always have a million mana lying around and the games always go to turn 15, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know, like witness protection also gets rid of the ability from the creature, right? It loses all abilities. Like that card seems way better to me. It becomes a legitimate business person with no no ability <laughs> that's to call. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a reason to include it on its own. But um yeah, I, I just can't imagine really wanting to to play this card. Like because the only thing, yeah, like I mean I'm sure like sometimes you'd play it if your opponent was on just like big green dudes, but I I think there are better options. No, that's a, yeah, no, 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 no. There's definitely cheaper, more efficient options. It like from my end it was purely if there's any like static abilities on creatures that you kind of that that is powerful in the format, but that's the thing. I, I also haven't played Pauper Cube in a hot second, so thought it was worth shouting out anyway. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, 
this next card, James, that you're going to read has, as far as I'm concerned, the raddest ability in all of Magic. Um, but there's just not there's just not enough of it. Uh, do you want to read the next card, James? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm depriving you of reading it. Um, <laughs> okay, next up we have Follow the Bodies. This is two and a blue for a sorcery. It has Gravestorm. For those who don't know, Gravestorm is when you cast this spell, copy it for each permanent put into a graveyard from the battlefield each turn. And the text of the card is Investigate. Um, you need to copy this card a lot for it to be good. <laughs> yes, I'm aware of that. I don't think this card's good, but I think it's cool. That's why, <laughs> that's why I added it to the list. I think Gravestorm is cool. Like, also, what... Worth mentioning, this is a commander card. You're not going to have to worry about playing against this at pre-release. That's also important to note. Like, you, <laughs> Gravestorm is not standard legal. I, I wasn't worried about this player, my opponents having <laughs> this at pre-release, to be honest. Um, I'm trying to think of good things you could do with this if you did put it in your deck. You could, like, scapeshift away all your lands, and then Gravestorm is, is a high number, I guess. But That's pretty good. But I mean, hopefully you're doing something better with your scapeshift list. I don't know, I'm struggling no, I know. with this one. No, too. no, it's, 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 I wanted to mention it because it was cool and I want more Gravestorm uh, to be printed in general. I, I, if this was an instant, I think it could be interesting because you can kind of play it as like a response to like, um, like a Wrath or something like that uh, as a bit of protection that way. Like, but as a sorcery, it means you have to do everything fairly like on a main phase and then play this. I'm assuming the idea is in Commander, crack all your clues, get a load of value, and then you can replace your clues, that kind of thing. But that's not really what we're doing in, in Cube. I thought it was cool. That's all. Right, moving on, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next up, we have Forensic Gadgeteer. It is two and a blue for a 2-3 creature for Tolkien artifact detective. It has, whenever you cast an artifact spell, investigate, which again means you make a clue token. It also has activated abilities of artifacts you control cost one generic less to cast. This effect can't reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana. So if you have a deck in your cube that cares about number of artifacts, then this is very tempting. It's a, I originally put Fairer, but I think it's a different version of Psy Master Thopterist. That's the one that makes Thopters, like 1-1 one, one flying Thopters, rather than Clues. And that one also has you can pay one a blue and sack two artifacts to draw a card. So, so, so I, I think they are, compa- they are comparable. But this also making your Clues only one to crack is a lot of card draw, like, and it still makes things like your Telerian Academy tap for more mana. It makes your constructs bigger and gives you the thing, and with those clues, gives you the ability to kind of draw through your deck. And, and the more I was thinking about it, the more that kind of reducing the activated cost of artifacts could be really important. Like, um, simple things kind of like reducing the equip cost of equipment is quite nice. But then I'm also assuming, does this just go, does this, does this just make infinite mana with Basalt Monolith? Yeah, 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 it does. That's pretty cool. Like, like, like. I think Psy generically is a stronger card because it, because it makes flyers, but like that gives it a bit more play in a, in some other decks, which I think is quite nice. Yeah, I agree with most of that. I I think I actually kind of like this more than Psy, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had Psy on my list to try in my cube, and I think I'm playing this instead now. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think I think this card's really strong. Um, yeah, the. Abilities, yeah. So you power up all your artifact stuff, the same as with Sai. You get you get your academy going, your Rosa going, etc. Really quickly. Um, but I kind of think pay one draw a card is is better than a flyer. Like obviously that's not universally true. Like if your opponent's beating you down, you'd rather have the creature. But um, I think you just summed up very well how we differ in Magic, James. I like turning things sideways. You like drawing <laughs> cards. <laughs> <laughs> That could draw more artifacts, doesn't it? That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's really particularly nice with Urza as well because it can it makes the clues basically free, right? You can yeah, that's true. Oh, because clues awesome. don't yeah. have to. It's not tap and sack. It's just pay two sack. So you can tap the clue to pay for the clue, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, I just think this has and and then on top of that, you have the basalt monolith combo. Even just like. Powering up your retrofitter foundry is really good. Um, oh, I didn't think about that. That's, that's incredibly annoying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although um, Sai is also quite messed up with retrofitter foundry, so uh, that's, that's I fair. guess we'll call okay. that even because it makes yeah. fopters and you can just sack them and make four fours. Oh, of course. Um, okay, damn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know. I think this is. 
I think it's definitely close with Sai. I think they're both worse than like Third Path and Sahili for the um, Academy decks, just because those ones trigger off any non-creature, and this and Sai need artifacts specifically. But I think I, th- I think this is a really interesting card. I'm, I'm definitely going to try it in my in my cube. I think. No, sick, awesome. All right, do you want to take it away with our next blue card? Sure. So next up, we have Intrude on the Mind. This is three blue blue for an instant. You reveal the top five cards of your library and separate them into two piles. An opponent chooses one of those piles, put that pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard, create a zero zero colorless fopter artifact creature token with flying, then put a one one counter on it for each card put into your graveyard this way. Um. This is strong, I think. Um, so it's worth noting the obvious. I think this people compare this sort of thing to stuff like fact or fiction a lot. Um, you make for piles and they choose is actually a lot worse than they make for piles and you choose, like fact or fiction. Um, but the creature you get out of this is great because um, you know just getting some board presence on your draw spell is is phenomenal, and it also actually makes the choice harder for them a lot of the time like say you might have a spot where you might normally go like two and three um there might be spots where you actually want to go like one and four they either give you four cards or they give you like the one card the one one good card and they give you like a four four flyer like obviously it depends on the board state but this is also an instant remember so if they're like you know if they're attacking you with uh if you play this in combat after they've attacked you and the flyer is just going to have a good block and eat a creature, then that makes the, the, the choice incredibly hard for them. And you can factor that in when you're making your piles, right? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting plays for this card. I think it's I think it's really strong, actually. Um, yeah, obviously, like, it's in speed. If you have, like, count spells in your deck and you want to be playing it instant speed anyway, I, I, I know, I think this is a great card. I think it's um, it's a better version of something like Commence the End Game, you know, like, Draw cards, make a big dude. Um, but you see a lot of cards for five mana. I, I don't know. I think this is really strong. So I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm well. I'm very open to being wrong on this. I really don't like this card. Ooh, spicy. I'm just kind of over like like paying even four mana for some card draw in in cube. Like like, like I know you can get you get a creature. I, yeah, but just just play Mole Drifter. Like, no, that's this, what this is, is so much. This I is, literally no. put in my notes, <laughs> Rick Moldrifter. No, like, yeah, no, no. It's a, it's a mythic from 2024. But like, like this is this is like an instant speed. This this, this is Moldrifter with flash. That's what this is. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> this is okay. The creature is normally going to be bigger than a two, and this is this is a lot better than draw two cards. You're seeing five cards deep. That's fair. Yes, yes, that is fair. You do see more, but just five is just so expensive. Like. Like I generally cut cut the higher card draw from my cube. Like like memory deluge came out of mine recently because it was just never really doing anything. Like like I just don't think that this this does enough for five mana. And I'm very open to being wrong. I'm very open to this like smashing the next couple of like pro tours or whatever we have now nowadays. I'm very aware that that could be a thing. I am aware that this five mana mythic in in 2024 could be a good magic card. But I just. I just don't think I want it. I like like <laughs> play a planeswalker, play an extra turn spell, something like that. Like I think that's what I want more than this at five mana in cube. I, yeah, as I said, I'm very open to being wrong, but I just just think I I, I think it is a very valid point. With this is a lot of mana to play for. You know, your effects on the board will be between a two two and a three three flyer most of the time, right? But um, I don't know, I just think there's a lot of um. I think it being an instant gives it a lot of legs for me. Um, I think partly I think I really want it to be good because I really like the play <laughs> pattern, you know. I think I really like the like fact or fiction type stuff. And I think this throwing in the the creature is makes it kind of more interesting as well, right? Like doing it in combat or like they're low and they can't give you a big creature. So then you just like get your best cards, you know. Um and no, I think it's uh I want it to be good. We'll see. I could believe it might not be, but I want it to be. <laughs> this is one of the joys of, of both of us now owning cubes, James. That is it's true. Yours. That is it's true. Yours. Crack on. Go ahead. It is going in. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put Mole Drifter back in mine, and we'll see. What... <laughs> okay. Okay. I will. I will believe that it is 
not as good as I think it is. But you are not trying to tell me that it is worse than Mole Drifter. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. All right, that's fair. I will concede that. I'll concede that. All right, let's move on to our next card. And this one also might be a bit of a conversation here. So next up, we have Linning, uh, Living Conundrum. This is four and a blue for a 2-5 creature elemental with hexproof. And if you would draw a card while your library has no cards in it, skip that draw instead. And as long as there are no cards in your library, Living Conundrum has base power and toughness 10-10 and has flying and vigilance. So. This is one I think specifically for Peasant because of the deck that I think it kind of powers up. So with this card, it means that combined with Laboratory Maniac, there are now two win conditions at Peasant for decks that can win with no cards left in their deck because we don't have Thassa's Oracle at Peasant or we don't have the four mana Jace that does it as well. Um, I don't know what that deck looks like, how you build that in Peasant, like maybe because like, you don't have Doomsday or anything like that, but maybe it's just with Dredges or maybe just with Self Milk. But the fact that it is something cool that means those decks can exist ma- makes it quite interesting. Because like, how good this card actually ends up being, I don't really know. Because like four man, like five mana for a two five with hexproof is not really where you're at. But if you're at a point where you think you can get to a point where this is a ten ten flying with vigilance, that is a win condition. Like it, it, it has hexproof. It's going to be very hard to deal with. It's going to be bigger than everything else in peasant. It's something interesting, I think, and that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it. Yeah, no, I think I think it's cool. Um, yeah, having a bit of redundancy for that effect is good. It's nice. Well, the hex proof means that you can just like roll it out early, right? Yeah. Um, you don't have to wait until you have done your whole thing. Whereas with Lab Man, you just kind of assume it's going to die. Yes. Yes. Yeah, stiff breeze, Lab Man. Yes. All right. Next up, we have Prof's Eidetic Memory. This is one a blue for a legendary enchantment. When Prof's Eidetic Memory enters the battlefield, you draw a card. You have no maximum hand size, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you've drawn more than one card this turn, put X plus one plus one counters on target creature you control, where X is the number of cards you've drawn this turn minus one. Um, So the turn you play it, you're getting one by default, right? Um, You've had your draw step and this draw. Um, And it goes up from there, which is cool. It is um, kind of the issue I have with this card is that how many like because the ideal you just want to be like look at my one one flyer and then into this and now it's a two two flyer and I'm drawing extra cards and that sounds great. But um most cubes that's just like kind of not what the blue decks are about. And like if I, if if in your cube it is then I think this is a really cool addition actually. I think it's great. Um it's also nice to flicker right as well. It's very good. Um but I just suspect that like there are too gonna be too many blue decks that just don't have the creature count you'd want to support this. Um it is also nice. Uh, the other good thing about it, though, is it turns like, you know, if you have big card draw spells later, you know, like Treasure Cruise or even like Blue Sun Zenith or something, it kind of turns those into into really big bumps, right? But, um, and obviously, just like your ponders and stuff come with a counter now, which is great. Um, I guess I could see it in like maybe a blue white deck, you know? Um, but you do need that mixture of I have cheap creatures to put it on and I have like cantrips. Um, yeah, I, I kind of think it just asks a bit too much of you in terms of what you need to have in your deck for this to be consistently good. But um, I do see, I think, that, I think there is upside to it. No, I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I think in general, kind of like enchantments that replace themselves for two mana, I kind of had to reevaluate since like uh, Up the Beanstalk's come out, you know. Um, I, I think the thing that kills this for me is like this, it's specifically the at the beginning of combat text, because this is a card that would in theory be really good with like, loot it'll core and like cards that when they deal combat damage to a player or attack you draw a card and discard a card and this would be great with those kind of effects but they happen after this has affected so you don't get any kind of bonus or buff with it like yeah i I think that's entirely where this kind of falls down kind of like the the one specific point where it where it would be good it doesn't actually work with and and then what you're saying about like like i didn't really think about this with like with like whether like draw sevens and stuff, but that's in like or like like big 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 bits of card draw kind of turning that into I guess a win condition. Like if you're in a cube that has wheels but doesn't have like shield rid or orcish bone master. Yeah, yeah. Like I just roll out my fastest oracle and then next turn I wheel <laughs> and fist put seven counters on my fastest oracle and I beat down. That's a new plan. That's it. <laughs> that's <laughs> fastest oracle winning games in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I don't know. I think yeah, the, the wheel stuff, I think they're just better payoffs, right? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a shame because it is a cool card. I like the idea of Lutril Core. It's a shame that doesn't work. Like, it is obviously good with, like, you know, Rono or something that you can just tap and loot. But, oh, that's um, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that kind of requires you to have another creature to put it on, right? Because just making your Rono or your Jace Rins Prodigy a bit bigger isn't that exciting. Yeah, yeah, that kind of screams, like, Outlast. Like, that kind of yes. very slow mechanic. Yeah, tap your creature, put a counter on it, it can attack later, maybe. Funnily enough, Outlast, not one, but made waves in cube. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's move on to uh, our next blue spell. Next we have Reasonable Doubt. This is a one in a blue for an instant. Count the target spell, and this is controller pays two generic, and you suspect up to one target creature. So this is the first time we've seen suspect, I think. Uh, the reminder that is a suspected creature has menace and can't block, which is kind of a nice little buff because it works offensively in two ways. We'll see that more on other cards than on this one, I think. But kind of like the ability to give your creature some evasion or to make your opponent's creature not be able to block is quite nice. But um, back to reasonable doubt. So this is a version of miscalculation, um, which is a counter spell, which 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 also counters a spell unless they pay two. But the additional extra value on miscalc is that it also has cycle for two mana, meaning you can do something with it when your opponent has more than enough mana to pay the two. This doesn't have that, so this won't go in generically as many decks. But the, I do think there is something with the suspect creature with this. Like, if you're specifically pushing like blue tempo in your cube, like those decks tend to kind of be on a bit of a knife edge. It's kind of they either just win or just lose. And kind of like, tell me if this is too niche, James. But maybe there is a world where kind of like you you counter something late game, even if your opponent can pay for it, just to kind of make a creature of theirs not be able to block or something like that. Like that, like that does sound a bit a bit niche. Now I'm saying it out loud, and 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 and, and there, there are a fair amount of counter spells available to us but like just just in in general like what do you think about reasonable doubt james do you think like it's good enough to get in like as well as miscalculation i i I think this is quite a lot worse than miscalculation it made me uh when you said this is a version of miscalculation i was like nah it's a version of quench (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah i don't know i think the thing with so i get like yeah if blue tempo is a thing but the thing is the blue tempo decks tend to already have really evasive creatures so, like, they tend to have a lot of flyers who are blockable creatures, right? So they're not that worried about their opponents. Um... But flying and menace, James. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You it's can, unblockable, you yeah. can yeah, yeah, suspect yeah, yeah, onto yeah. your flyer. That's true. But um, I don't know. Miscalc's a really strong card. Um, like, it's just never bad. Whereas this is going to be aggressively bad quite a lot of the time, I think. Like, a lot, yeah. Just, I just think, like, a lot of those decks are looking to, like, you know, beat down in the air with a base of creatures and block on the ground, and you might actively not want to suspect your opponent's creature. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I really see it. I think there are just better op- options for your two mana counters. No, very fair. Very fair. Yeah, we do have a fair train of good ones, including just like original counter spell and like mana leak and remand and loose focus. Yeah, they're all better. Okay, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> all good. It's worth talking about. Yeah. Um, cool. Next up, we have Reenact for Crime. This is a cool one, I think. I don't know if it's good. Yeah, I like this one. Um, this is one blue, blue, blue. So four mana total for an instant. Exile target non-land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn. Copy it. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. This is this just seems like it has a lot of potential to do dumb stuff for me. Um, yeah. So, for example, right, like we were talking about the Dream Halls deck earlier, like with playing the big boss and whatnot. Imagine you just go like, you know, my frantic search away, my time spiral, untap my lands, cast this, cast the time spiral. God forbid you have a high tide going, like the game's over, <laughs> right? Um, it just it speeds you up so much. Or you and you know, you can even do that with just like a looter or whatever in play, right? Ways to put your cards in your graveyard that don't cost mana seem really good here. Um You can also this also kind of obviously does a reanimate thing, right? You can get that creature. It was phenomenal with the Eldrazis, right? The um the ones that shuffle back in, like oh, this is an instant speed reanimate for those. Oh, sick. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. Yes, it's an instant speed reanimate, and you cast it. Oh dear God! Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, okay, so. you do this on your Ember Cool, you will get the extra turn. Um, Ooh. Ooh, James, that's uh, spice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does a lot. Um, it's also not specific to your graveyard. 
Mm -hmm. Like, you know, your opponent loots away some expensive spell, you just get it. Um, you force his first spell, obviously it's a later game play, but you can just get it. Um, and the spells, spells good for graveyard and cube. You can even, you know, I mean, it's not exciting in this quite the same way, but like, imagine you go like snuff out your creature, I get back your creature in combat, you know? I, th I think there's just like, I can see a lot of scenarios for this card to be really good. Um, you know, even like they just go like, oh, tap out my fact or fiction. You go, cool, I'll oh, fact or fiction as well. Nice. Um, it, it seems like you'll always find some, well, not always, you'll often find something good to do with this card. Mm -hmm. And some amount of the time you'll get to do a combo thing that'll be phenomenal. No, definitely. You know, I think this is just, this is kind of like a nice little crossover card that kind of, Interacts nicely with every of the cheaty brokeny decks. So, like, yeah. So you, you mentioned like Dream Halls, Reanimator, but also like it kind of what does work with Sneak Attack, um, even with like Flash. Like you're putting yeah. it's going to your graveyard. Like, like, like it. It's probably because of the triple blue. It's probably not like top tier, like the best thing that that those decks are doing. But it's it's the fact that it's it's like up there with all of those decks and can cross borders and kind of go into multiple of them means that this could just be just a nice bit of redundancy in your cube for kind of just like a here's a bit of a catch-all for those decks like i quite like that yeah 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 for sure um i think it's just like i'm kind of it's one of those cards where like i'm excited to see what people do with this yeah, yeah. you know um I, I i think it has potential to be pretty cool no awesome yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm i'm a big fan of reenact the crime i think uh, yeah it's on my list to pick up already so yeah that should be sweet nice Right, moving on to black now, we have Case of the Stashed Skeleton. This is one black for another enchantment case. So again, it comes in and has the ability, when this case enters the battlefield, create a 2-1 black skeleton creature token and suspect it. It basically means you end up with a 2-1 black skeleton with menace that can't block. Then to solve the case at the beginning of your end step, you solve it if you control no suspected skeletons. So you can either... I, I don't know if, there's, if there is a way to unsuspect your skeleton, but the easy way is just the skeleton dies. That would also do that. When you do solve it, you can pay one black to sacrifice this case, search your library for a card, put it in your hand, then shuffle, activate only as a sorcery. So this just seems perfectly fine in quite a lot of... Actually, is this fine in like in like most black decks? Like, putting down a 2-1 Black Menace uh, onto the board, obviously, Mono Black Aggro, James's favourite deck, will absolutely, <laughs> absolutely love that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, to turn this into a demonic tutor, all you need to do is have your skeleton die at some point. Like, there is a world where just, like, that skeleton could just get in for so much damage over the course of a game because your opponent doesn't want you to just have a, have a tutor to the best card in your deck. So that's pretty strong. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah if, if you have a way of sacrificing it, uh, a way of controlling when it dies, just turning that into a demonic tutor just seems pretty good. Um, yeah, I kind of like this card. Uh, what do you think, James? Yeah, I think this is cool. Um, I think it's got some stuff going on. I, I think there are, you want to be at least a little bit aggressive. Um, mono black aggressive, James? N never mono black <laughs> aggressive, but you do want to be a little bit aggressive because um, the thing is, if you're just like a controller or a combo deck, right? Because the skeleton can't block, your opponent will just can just like take ten from the skeleton, and you're not pressuring their life total in any other way, and it's not going to be great. Um, but if you are a little bit aggressive, I think the actual best spot for this is if you're aggressive and sacrificing stuff in like a red mm -hmm. black deck. Um, then you can like proactively get rid of a skeleton if you want to. But and those decks just really care about their opponent's life total. So like a two mana two one menace to start off with is just not a bad thing at all. Um, and then yeah, obviously like. If the skeleton trades with something, I sack it for some value, and you just get this demonic tutor. No, it's, it seems pretty cool. I think it's like a nice little, um, like aggressive slanted value card. Imagine this in a lower stack as well, by the way. Yeah, yeah, he's going to keep like getting it DTs. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you DT him, and you just get it back with Lois and go again. Yeah, that seems very good. I, I, I guess as well, just just with mentioning, like you don't have to sack it straight away when you do it. It's just it's solved. For the rest of the game, at that point, kind of like the what's the one from from initial Ixalan? like the city's blessing. It's just a city's thing blessing, that it, yeah. it's a thing that like the card gains. It has been solved, and then at any point in the future, you can cash it in. So yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. This seems very solid. Yeah, yeah, I think it does some stuff. All right, next up we have Long Goodbye. 
This is a one black for an instant. This spell cannot be countered, and it destroys target creature or planeswalker with converted mana cost three or less. Um, yeah, this is a really solid removal spell. Um, it's a strictly better version of Eliminate, um, which is the same card without the uncounterable. Um, Eliminate, I think, is like has gone in and out of some cubes. I, I think it's probably more out than in at the moment. Like Bitter Triumph got added, and that maybe pushed some of them out. But um, it's it's definitely like a solid option in that tier of like you know, there's a lot of Wonder Black killer things, right? Like terror variants. Um, I think comparing this to something like Infernal Grasp is like a question of how many free mana cost planeswalkers are there versus like larger creatures that you would want to kill with Infernal Grasp. Um, like, Uncounterable, I think, has got better in the last few years, not because counter spells have got better, but just because they put ward on so much stuff now. Yeah. And this, yeah, the ward is a counter when it goes off. So with this, you can just not pay for the ward and the spell will resolve anyway. Um, yeah, I think this is this is a nice upgrade over an already solid card. No, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I was initially a, a, a bit down on it, but that's just more because we've just literally had the best one printed in like Bitter Triumph, like last set. But um, yeah, no, I'm I'm just looking at my uh, at the ones I'm running in my in my cube, and this probably is better than Power Word Kill. If I'm honest with you, like that's on this destroy target non angel, non demon, non devil, and non dragon. That is generally the bigger things in my cube anyway. So the fact that this also hits planeswalkers around and and the mana value of stuff is hitting is normally about the same that yeah yeah i can see that i i can see giving this a go yeah i mean its power does depend a bit on like how many free mana cost planeswalkers you have in your cube right cuz um yeah but but i mean there are a lot of cubes have a lot right like obviously oko sahili there's Duretti, there's a lot of really good ones unfortunately it doesn't hit minsk and boo <laughs> that's the one it does, it does hit it does hit boo it does not hit oh, it's boo oh that's all right yeah, yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of the hamster. But yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. That, I'm sure we won't be seeing that again. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, let's move on to our next black card. Next up, we have Masker Girl, Known Killer. It is two black black for a four four legendary creature, human assassin with menace, and has the interesting ability of creatures you control have wither, which, as a reminder, means they deal damage to creatures in the form of minus one minus one counters. And whenever a creature an opponent control dies, if its toughness was less than one, draw a card. So I actually quite like this card, not just going back to mono black aggro, but any kind of black X deck with creatures I could see playing this. Like probably not in like the higher powered level cubes, where it's not a guarantee your opponents will even have any creatures to shrink down to get any value from this. Like, like, like if you're putting this in your cube, realistically, you want to be drawing at least one card off of this to be kind of happy with it. I think that basically means kind of like like if you're not playing it in a higher powered level cube, it means it's not competing against things like Shieldred or Invert of Truth. It's 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 against kind of more fairer creatures, and yeah, yeah. If creature combat matters in your cube, then I think this is a pretty solid include. Like, like wither is very very annoying. Yeah, no, I agree with all that. Um, I think it's a cool card. Um, the one thing I wanted to add is that it's it's cute that this is kind of a combo with the original Massacre Girl. Oh, it is. Yes. Okay, that's sweet. Yeah. Because yeah. unlike a built out board, it kills everything, but it makes everything low toughness, low power. Or toughness, yeah, before it dies. So uh, so you get cards off everything. So we're running both Masker Girls. Is that the plan? Yeah, yeah. Masker <laughs> okay, Girl I Tribal. Like Let's I go. like this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, next up, we have Outrageous Robbery. This is X Black Black for an instant. Target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. If you cast a spell this way, you may spend mana or as though it was mana of any type to cast it. Um, yeah, uh, this is a good little piece of card advantage in black. Um, instant speed's really nice here. Like, just get to like tap out for this and vet in their end step on tap, play some cards. Um, I will say that drawing cards off of their deck is worse than drawing cards off of your deck. Unless you've built your deck really, really badly and their deck's great, in which case, <laughs> sure. Um, I could see that, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but in general, it's worse, right? Because hopefully the cards in your deck synergize with the cards in your deck. 
and the cards in their deck probably won't synergize with the other cards in your deck that you have to play. But um, yeah, no, I mean, it has a lot of flexibility. You can play lands off of this as well, which is nice if you're if you're a bit stuck on mana. Um, it means, you know, say you'd like roll it out for like X equals three or something. Um, you know, you get a land and then like maybe like you play one of the ex- more expensive spells later. Um, but I think this isn't for most powerful cubes, right? Like compare this to the um, to the fact or fiction Muldrifter card we we reviewed earlier, <laughs> and I think even Daniel will admit that 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 one's a lot better. Yes, I will concede that. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Like th- th- this just seems just a little bit too expensive to be really happy with it. Like what you said about the matchups. Like it does kind of sometimes stealing cards from your opponents that can be good. Like like obviously the dream is to, like you you steal their kiki cheeky and then your opponent can't do anything. But like that's more wishful thinking than like consistency like like, like yeah if, if, if i'm honest with you i think i'd rather play like something like deadly dispute than, than this card just something cheaper that is going to kind of guarantee to get me value from my deck yeah totally like the the issue is that but will also be quite frequent that you know you exile your opponent's um cabal ritual and yagmuth's will and it's like cool these don't these don't help my uh <laughs> my black control deck that much you know um but yeah, I think the, the only other thing that is kind of cute about it is that it messes up top deck shooters. Like, they vamp, you cast this, you, uh, you like, blanked their vamp and got some cards. Um, oh, that's quite nice. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think in general, this is probably going to be a bit weak for, for really powerful cubes. No, yeah, I very much agree with that. All right, next up, we have Snarling Gorehound. It is a single black for a 1-1 creature dog with menace, and whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, surveil one. So I think this is a fine card. Like it is, it's a common, um, and I think it just does enough in like a couple of different decks that means it could see play as like an overlap piece. So like, yes, okay, in a black in a black aggressive deck, it is fine, not exciting. Like, like if you can get a counter onto this, then I do like it a lot more. If if you ha- if you have ways in black of, of boosting its power, I like it a bit more. And also, just in kind of like a self milli deck, like surveil one will just like put a couple of cards into your graveyard that will just will help the deck out. I don't think it's fantastic. My notes say not as good as Thraven Inspector, but similar. In in the right kind of cube, in like a poor person cube, I think it will be that. I, this isn't one for higher power level cubes like Thraven Inspector, but yeah, it's a it's a little body that it, it gives you a little bit of advantage over the course of the game. It, it doesn't need to do much for one mana. Yeah, I'd agree with all that. Seems, seems perfectly solid and pauper and probably not for other cubes. All right, next up we have Vein Ripper. This is three black, 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 so six mana total for a 6-5 creature vampire assassin. Has flying, ward, sacrifice a creature, and whenever a creature dies, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. Um, Listen, there's a lot of Really good stuff to like about this card. The it's very big, James. It's very big. <laughs> it's very big. The ward's powerful and kind of synergizes with the drain ability. Um, I just kind of think too much. Six is too much. Um, it's kind of six puts it in that realm of the like kind of castable, kind of reanimatable, right? But mm. you know, if you're reanimating this, I think you're you're pretty unhappy, really. Like. Like not that it won't win some games, but um, and you just want something a bit more. Um, but it gives you li- value a bit more reliably, you know. Like if they have a little dude sitting around to sacrifice, and they just kill this. You're you're pretty unhappy about it, right? The the card I compare it to is like Grave Titan at this mana cost, right? And that yeah. just that just does that's so much more. Have. Yeah, yeah, that's what I have, and I also think in like so. Yes, this is a big flyer, but the ability is. An aristocrat ability, and I think you'd rather have Grave Titan at six in an aristocrat deck than you probably would this. Grave Titan makes you the bodies like, and just this kind of effect you want on as on as cheaper effect as possible, just because you, it means you can get it out, and it's part of your like you're building like a little engine, kind of like, like you're building like a puzzle of like of like token makers, sacrifice outlets, and and then your blood artist effects like this. I don't think you need this at six mana. You, I, I think you would rather run like. Two or three ones that are one to three mana than this card. Yeah, hundred percent. Like your six drop should not need help, right? Um, like, yes, I'm sure 
Brave Titan would be a better six in an Aristocrats deck, but I think the actual answer is I don't want to put a six in my Aristocrats deck, you know? Or if you are, it's like a big, it's like an X spell that's either putting creatures into play that scales with your deck or or something that's bringing creatures back from the graveyard to play. Uh, yeah, sure. I think the thing is, for a six drop fight, it has to be able to pull you back from behind really well. And this card kind of just doesn't, right? If you're... If your opponent has a good board and they're threatening lethal, this is basically just one blocker in, a set, in, in effect. And I, th- I think that's not enough for six mana. No, it makes sense. I'm glad the card exists because, yeah, it is about time we had a bigger Blood Artist. But yeah, it's a bit too pricey for what I think most cubes are generally going to be looking for. Right, let's move on to red now. Uh, we have another case. It is the case of the Crimson Pulse. It is two and a red for an enchantment case. When this case enters the battlefield, discard a card, then draw two cards. To solve the case, at the beginning of your end step, uh, you solve it if you have no cards in your hand. And then when it's solved, at the beginning of your upkeep, discard your hand, then draw two cards. So I actually quite like this card. So obviously we have mono red, but for me, where I actually want to play this is like the madness deck. For me, that's the more obvious place because there tends to be overlap with like the hellbent type of decks where kind of like decks that care about having zero cards in hand. And we've not gotten a payoff for the Hellbent deck in ages. Like I think since the actual... What's the Red God from Amonkhet, actually? That might be the last like payoff for that deck. Uh, Hazaret. The Hazaret was the, kind of the last payoff for that kind of deck that, that, that we've had in a while. Uh, and this is definitely... I think this is, this is a payoff for that deck. Basically, this is draw two additional cards every turn. I think in those kind of builds, like in, in Madness or in the Hellbent decks, you are very easily going to be activating this. You're, you're going to be dumping your hand getting value from that and then refilling your hand this will dump your and then you can dump it again and again i think that's quite good um you probably ca- could still run this in mono red it will be good there but i don't think it'll be as good there when you're not fully benefiting from the discard uh, what do you think james what do you think of the case of the crimson pulse yeah i kind of like it um i don't know if it's going to be maybe too clunky for like for most powerful cubes but um i, th- I see yeah i think it'd definitely be great in madness but i think even in just like pretty low curve red black or mono red like interactive stuff it could also be quite good right um because it's nice as well with the first chapter you don't if you play this as your last card then you still draw two cards right you the draw isn't tied to having discarded a card so you can just like play out your removal some creatures when maybe like you know turn five or six you're rolling this out and this is like your card draw engine that's going to win you the game. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know in the same way as you do so often with like seasoned um, seasoned pyromancer. Um, but this but this gives you like that ongoing card advantage. Obviously, the downside is like it's not providing you um, immediate board presence. But I, I think it's like you know the one card advantage effect you have to like get over the line. I, I think this could be pretty good. Sweet. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Cool. Um next up we have Concealed Weapon. This is one red for a artifact equipment. It has equipped creature has plus three plus O. Oh. You can disguise it. So play it as a face down two two and the disguise cost is Two and a red, and when it's turned face up, you attach it to target creature you control. Um, I really don't like this card, actually. <laughs> um, like, if you're as an equipment, I think it's too weak, right? Two to play, two to equip. Uh, sorry, I should have mentioned that. The equip cost is one and a red, and two to play, two and equip plus three plus O, not good enough. It's not giving you toughness, it doesn't win combat. Um, and then by the time you and then so if you're disguising it, you're like six mana you've paid six mana by the time you turn it face up. And it doesn't even win combat. Like I'm sure it'll get some damage in, like if you've got like a flower or a double striker or something, it could be good. But at that amount of mana, I want it to at least win the combat. And this, yeah, not giving any toughness seems seems kind of rough to me. No, I, I think that's fair. I added this one to the list. I, again, like because it's a uncommon, this one is, and I guess, aimed more at peasant if you're trying to do the equipment matters thing. Because what I said earlier about like um, things being better about being like like being equip being equipment and creatures. This is again sort of that because of the disguise. You have a lot less options in red at uncommon. 
that should that could just mean the deck just shouldn't exist. But I thought it was <laughs> yeah no, okay yeah yeah I could see that I guess I think without going and like looking at them specifically I think there's a lot of the like for Mirrodin type cards I'd probably rather over this. I would agree. I make you talk about one red equipment matters card every <laughs> set review, James, and here we go. That is true. We can't be abandoning <laughs> traditions, can we? <laughs> it's a it's a thing, James. It's a bit now. <laughs> okay. I guess it is. I guess it is. <laughs> we have acquired a thing. That's good. Um, cool. Next up, we have connecting the dots. This is one red for an enchantment. Whenever a creature you control attacks, exile the top card of your library face down. You can't look at it. Um, and for one the red, you can discard your hand, sacrifice connecting the dots, and put all cards exiled with connecting the dots into their owner's hands. So it's kind of like a Bomat Courier, but it's not a creature. Um, mm. That's a lot worse than being Bomat Courier, I think. Like The issue is, right, this wants to go in an aggressive deck and to, for it to be good, you have to play it really early, right? You want to be like, play my one drop, play this on turn two, attack, attack, attack every turn. Then by like, the game goes long, by like turn six or seven, I have like five cards under here. And that's a really nice way to restock. I think that, that's the upside, right? The issue is, if you play a one drop and your opponent passes, and then you have this or a two drop creature in your hand, like a t- any. Like generic two drop aggressive creature, robber of the rich, say for example. Are you really casting this over casting for robber? I'm I'm not sure you are. And then if you just hold it until you get to a stage where you don't have a good creature or removal spell that you really want to play this turn, then either the game's ended because your beatdown plan won, or you've run out of stuff, in which case, like you've run out of other cards to play and you've aimed possibly don't have good attacks by then. I think I don't really see how this lines up, I guess, is my issue. No, that's fair. I, I, I'm a little higher on it, but I think, uh, yeah, it, it's not a card you're, you're playing on turn two. It's a card you're playing on three or four along with a hasty creature with some other creatures, because like, this does stack. So, so if you attack with three creatures, you do get three cards under it. The fact it you can go wide with this means I think it could be quite good. Like 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 this 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 was just like a rabble master. If I'm honest with you, seems like it could be like decent enough value. I think that's I think that's where I'm thinking of it as like 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 if you're if you're going wide, if you have any kind of tokens like that kind of thing, I think that this could just if this can draw you just like three or four cards, then I think you're very happy with it in that red deck. My my apologies. I actually completely misread this. I thought we were only. I thought it was like whenever you attack, so we'd only get one card a turn. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. No, I like it quite a bit more then. Um, like I still don't think it's one for like uh, you know really high power level cube, but I think it's um, I think it's a cool card in that case. Like yeah, it's a nice like go wide payoff, right? You can yeah, just play. You maybe only need one or two attack steps, and you uh, and you restock. That seems kind of cool. No, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Seems like a fun one. Like like like. like... I don't think there's enough room in your cube for connecting the dots and the case of the Crimson Pulse that we mentioned earlier. But I think there's room in, in most cubes for like maybe one of these red effects that gives you a bit more card advantage. Right, but let's move on to our next red card. Next up, we have Crime Novelist. This is two and a red for a 1-3 creature goblin bard. It has, whenever you sacrifice an artifact, put a plus plus one counter on Crime Novelist and add a red. So, so this is an interesting card. Like I've tried the Arist Scraps archetype for a while. That's the thing we're kind of you are sacrificing artifacts and pinging your opponents. Kind of like how Aristocrats is creatures and blood artists, Aristocrats is artifacts and ping effects, things like Only Cult Anvil maybe that drain out your opponent when you're sacrificing artifacts. I kind of cut that from my cube because I realized just beating people down with artifacts was a little bit better, but this does seem like a really interesting card if you are doing that kind of thing. The fact that this also like, effectively doubles up the amount of mana your treasure makes when you when you sack them because you'll make an additional red when you sack a treasure that actually seems pretty good like like if treasure making is a thing that your queue can do very easily and i do quite like this a lot there is also an infinite combo with this i think that's why people are talking about this card quite a bit online if you have a spare artifact an animation module and then a sack outlet so actually i'll read animation module just because it is one that people might not be aware of because it's came out back in Kaladesh. 
Um, animation module is a generic mana for an artifact. Whenever one or more plus one encounters are put on a opponent you, you control, you may pay one generic. If you do, create a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. So the way that interacts with this is you sacrifice the artifact, it puts a counter onto the crime novelist, and you make a red mana to pay for the animation module, meaning you make another servo, which you can then sack, and kind of the whole thing goes infinitely. You effectively... Crime Novelist becomes infinitely big. You don't, you're not up any mana, but you will have infinite death triggers. So if you have something like a Blood Artist or like a Goblin Bombardment as your sacrifice outlet, then you can kill your opponents. Like That's, that's kind of cool. Like, I do actually quite like that. Um, it, that might be a, a, a little tricky for Cube, just because I don't... Animation module is a bit of a hard sell for Cube. It's cool, but I don't think it really fits into what most cubes are trying to do. But it's interesting, at least, and kind of... It's another thing that kind of crime novelist does have going for it, but just in in general, I think it's a fine. I think it's a cool card, and yeah, just the base level of doubling doubling up your treasures might make it just playable by itself. It sounds cool. You can you can Urza Saga for your animation module. Well, that's fair. That's yeah, pretty yeah. good. Um, yeah, no, I think it's 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 a good card. Uh, it's a cool card. I think it's kind of clunky to really get going. I like the idea of it. Yeah, doubling up your treasures, also just like. You can crack your like blood for free, right, and get counters on it, and um, you can, and like see so your your clues effectively call, give give you one mana back and give you counters. Um, I think all that stuff's kind of cool, but it's like you're assuming you have already made all these tokens, in which case, like stuff's probably going okay for you. Um, you'd Probably in most decks, just rather have your free drop like do a bit more on its own rather than needing this setup. Um, if you're not like actually going infinite with it, um, I'm sure like there are there are ways to go infinite with, but honestly, they're like more setup than like in a lot of the spots. I think it's like this is a bit win more in your combo things. Like, so for example, it makes like fop to sword actually infinite, right? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But, you're already doing pretty well if you've assembled your your Popter Foundry and your Sword of Meek. You don't lose that many of those games. You probably don't need to put this card in your deck to make it better. Um, yeah, I'd I'd love to be proven wrong, actually. Um, <laughs> I like this sort of stuff, but um, yeah, I, I I suspect this one's a bit weak. Um, like in in the like combo art sacking your artifacts decks, like KCI does so much more. Right, like it gives you two mana. And it is a sack outlet on its own. This requires a sack outlet to go with it. No, it makes sense. Yeah, K- yeah. Kazo is a busted magic card. That, 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 actually, I don't think I've really seen it in cubes that much. But maybe that is something for the future that we need to keep an eye on. It was in. Um, it was a cool cube on Magic Online, maybe like a year ago. That I think Caleb Gannon built it's called like a Synergy Cube. It was like powered cube, but without all of the like easy ways to win, basically, and. Um, like Saki Artifacts KCI stuff was one of the good art- archetypes and you um like getting your mirror retriever going and all that nonsense. Um but it's like very finicky and hard to build and easy to mess up. And easy to time out on Magic Online actually. <laughs> yes, I yes, I could imagine. Yes, that is something I very much forget as a is a <laughs> is a yeah. thing you have to think about when playing cube. Yeah. So it, it takes me five minutes to work out how my loop works, and then a further fifteen minutes to execute the loop. So I need like <laughs> five <laughs> game actions for one point of damage, and then I look, then I run out of time and die. Great. <laughs> Next up, we have demand answers. This is one red for an instant. As an additional cost to cast your spell, sacrifice an artifact or discard a card, and you can draw two cards. Um, so this is like a better thrill of possibility, right? It just gives you an extra option of of sacking an artifact. Um, you're probably not going to have a ton of these like tormenting voice style things in your in your cube. Um, by which I mean you probably have like zero to one. Um, a bit, bitter reunion is probably the main competition, right? Um, that's the enchantment where you does a tormenting voice thing, and then you can pay one sack it to give your creatures haste until end of turn. Um, I could see in like the right cube, this could be better. Like if you have a lot of like disposable artifacts lying around in, in a lot of the decks, m- making little artifact tokens. Like, yeah, this card could could do some work. No, I, agree. I think this card is just it's it's just generically fine and good. Like, like obviously, like I, it, actually, 
it, it's very kind of like bread and butter card. Like it kind of like triggers your pyromancer style of effects, that kind of thing. It's like buying the spell singer deck, buying in any deck that's kind of just wants a bit of card selection. Um, it's one of these cards that kind of, if I saw this in pretty much any cube, I'd be like, okay, yeah, fine, whatever. Like it's in there, but it's not a card that I think like, like power level wise, I think it's fine, but kind of like synergy wise, there could be some questions kind of like, yeah, yeah, you mentioned bit of reunion that one has a bit of play in like just any kind of red deck to give to give things haste but also in red based reanimate decks to kind of get, get your creature to attack the same turn that kind of stuff like like i know in mine i'm, I'm also running like uh, a card like cathartic pyre that's uh discard up to two cards then draw that many cards but it also has deal three damage to target creature or planeswalker like those are the options with that kind of that's a bit more of a flexible card whereas this is just efficient at what this does so Solid. It was, it was probably see some play, but if as equally, if it was run, if it was not run, I would not be surprised. It's not a card that's going to be like I demand answers to where it demand answers is. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Fugitive Codebreaker. It is one red for a two-one creature goblin rogue with prowess, haste, and disguise five and a red. That cost is reduced by one generic for each instant sorcery card in your graveyard, and when it is turned face up, discard your hand and then draw three cards. So I actually quite like this card. This is everything I want from a card like this. It has the kind of the modal play of the cheap, early, good, prowess, hasty threat. Then later game, it's effectively like another copy of Bedlam Reveler. Like Bedlam Reveler, yeah, I, I think it's better late game than this because that starts as a 3-4 with prowess and this is just a 2-1. But the fact that you can split the mana over, over a couple of turns with this, I think is good. Or just play it on turn two and just attack your opponent, I think is very good. Um, I like the effect that this has early game and late game, just being able to refill your hand. Like you're not discarding any cards, really. You're drawing three cards when you do that. Like that's just all upside. Like I really like it. I think this this is like a slam dunk test for me, if I'm honest. Yeah, I think you're gonna wind up playing it as the two drop like more often than you disguise it by a decent amount. Um, but like when you disguise it, it'll be really good, right? Like draw it late, and I think you yeah you want to be like. A red deck with a lot of burn, basically, right? So you're stocking up your graveyard and triggering prowess a lot. Um, I wonder if it winds up being one that more sees play in, like, if cubes are specifically doing the prowess thing rather than in just, like, general mono red decks. Because if you're in mono red with, like, you know, 14, 15 creatures, I don't know that I like this very much. Out of interest, would you like, like, this or Monastery Swift Spear, if you were just to compare the two? I just think like the competition's so much weaker for wet red one drops, right? Like there's Ragavan and Figure of Destiny, and then you're out of good ones, and that's kind of why Spot Monastery Swift Spear tends to make the cut. Um, so I think just because of it being one, I'd probably say Swift Spear. I'd probably say Swift Spear. Um, whereas like the red twos are pretty good. Like Magda's actually pretty legit. Um, yeah, Inti's pretty good as well. Oh, Inti's very so magic messed card. up. <laughs> That card's absurd. Yeah. So yeah, I think just for reasons of the competition, I, I, I think this one might get edged out. No, that's fair. I could see that. I might. I think I'm going to be testing this, but that's for a different reason that we'll talk about with our next card. Do you want to take it away with the new Krenko, James? Yeah, for sure. Next up, we have Krenko, Baron of Tin Street. This is two and a red for a legendary creature goblin. It is a free free with haste. Good start can tap it to, and sacrifice an artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on each goblin you control, and whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may play red. If you do create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token, it gains haste until end of turn. This seems cool. Um, so the question is, right, if you didn't have any other goblins, is this good? Um, I kind of want to say no, because it's like, and then it's like, well, I need goblins and I need artifacts sitting around to sacrifice. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't really think just pumping this and the tokens it makes that, like, it's fine, but it's not exciting, right? Um, but if you were, like, supporting goblins as a thing in your cube, then I could definitely see being in a spot where it's like, you know what, there's enough, like, treasures and blood and all that other nonsense like that you can they're sitting around waiting to be sacrificed but yeah i could see that game this game pretty good if, yeah, if that, in that case because then it's like you tap it you sacrifice your blood you pay one you make a goblin it's now a two two um that does 
stack how you want because the trigger will resolve uh, the, the triggered ability that so that you make a goblin will resolve before the trigger to put a plus one plus one counter on your goblins and you're buffing your other goblins and that, at that point that sounds really good no exactly that's yeah that's well, effectively what i was going to say is like um i currently have a very big artifact theme in my cube right now and i'm tr- thinking of adding goblins to red like making like red be about goblins but also like do like some combos in like jund with goblins and that is not everyone's cube that's a little bit niche but this card actually seems pretty perfect in that because it fills that gap covers enough things that different decks are trying to do i I, I think on its own, the kind of like this needs artifacts probably more than other goblins, but it gets way better if you have other goblins, basically. Yes, I mean if you don't have artifacts, it's just a free free haste. For free, this this yeah. doesn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it, it seems cool. It's also nice, right, that you can if you sack the artifacts to other abilities, you can still make for goblins, which is kind of good. No, that's true. Yeah, yeah, and no, that's nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I basically just. I think it's a bit more interesting than kind of like the fourth Rabble Master card if you were trying something like that. But yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. Next up and last in red, we have Tasak Judas Hellhound. It is three in a red for a 3 3 legendary creature elemental dog. It has Unleash, which means you can have this creature enter the battlefield with a plus one counter on it, but it means it can't block as long as it has that counter on it. It also has other dogs you control have Unleash. Creatures you control with counters on them have Haste. And whenever it attacks, add a red for each attacking creature. So effectively, this is four mana for a four four with haste. Like that's a perfectly fine base level. Obviously, this gets better, and I think just generally like playable in the first place. Like like if you're in a cube that has ways of putting counters onto your other creatures, just having them come down with haste is a bonus. It is an upside. Like, like it doesn't have to be plus one counters. It can be like some of the um, ability counters that that we've seen before. That kind of thing. Um, and then just the ability to make make you some red mana so you can follow up with some plays afterwards. Maybe you play this on four, you attack with it, and then you play another four drop or something afterwards. It it's, it seems all right. I, red fours is, is a little bit tricky just because it is competing against things like Rampaging Raptor, Hell Rider, and Caves of Chaos Adventurer. But I think like in the right cube, if you're doing if you're doing something specifically with counters, or I guess actually dogs, which could be quite cool. I want to see that. Um, <laughs> it could be fun. What do you think, James? Yeah, I basically agree. Um, four four haste before is decent, but um, yeah, the, it's awkward as well. The, it doesn't have the this mana doesn't go away as your phases end text, so you have to oh, be able to okay. use mana at instant speed. Basically, you create it when you attack. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's, oh okay. That that's actually quite annoying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, there'll be good turns with that, right? You go like. Play this, attack, make a red, bolt your blocker. That seems really good. Um, but I think, yeah, in general, it's going to wind up being worse than those other cards. I, 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 I didn't know how many dogs there were around. I did a search in my cube, and Scrapwork Mutt was the only was the only current dog mm, in there. Let's have a look. Um, so I don't think that's a huge amount of a card, unless you like specifically get out of your way to support it, which seems unlikely. Um, Mine is also a Scrapwork Mutt. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think basically like it's fine, but the other red falls are probably better. Right. So that is the end of red, and that's going to be the end of the episode. Do make sure that you follow the podcast. Give us a five star review. Give us a thumbs up. Tell a friend. All that good stuff really helps us grow the podcast. Because next week we're going to be looking at everything else from Murders at Karlov Manor. I'll put links to our Twitters down in the description below. If there's any cards we've missed and you want us to talk about them in the next episode, do give us a shout. But until then, James, thank you as always, man. Pleasure? Always a pleasure. Looking forward to next week. Yep, there's still plenty of bangers from this set for us to look at. Until then, goodbye from me, goodbye from James, and we'll see you all soon. Goodbye.